hello 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 sir good afternoon yeah hi so hope my voice is clear yes sir yes your voice is absolutely clear okay that's great yeah so can we start now yeah yeah go ahead okay cool Good evening to all the dignitaries, guests, and delegates with great joy and immense exultation. On behalf of IEEE CIS Student Branch Chapter and GH Raisoni College of Engineering, I, Gauri Mahalle, feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all present here to the fourth part talk session on artificial neural networks by Mr. Nanda Kishore M in the series The Age of AI, conducted by IEEE CIS Student Branch Chapter GHRC. I request Ms. Danashri Borgaukar, Executive Committee Member at IEEE CIS Student Branch Chapter, GHRC, to welcome our today's guest. Good afternoon, everyone. I extend a warm welcome to all at the fourth Power Talk session of IEEE CIS. I find immense pleasure in having our honorable guest, Mr. Nanda Kishore M., with us. The presence of such a personality in our Power Talk session is a blessing. We hope that the students are able to seek a little guidance and imbibe something from his thoughts. Through this session, I believe students will able to identify their vulnerable places that include their improvements. In addition, students will also be able to know more about the age of AI. Once again, we are very grateful for accepting our invitation and marking his presence here. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Gauri. Thank you, Dhanashree. I am profoundly elated to take an opportunity to deliver a part talk session on artificial neural networks. Sir is a senior data scientist at Gramina. Sir has almost three years of industry experience, especially in the field of computer vision and deep learning. He has completed his B.Tech in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Kale University, and he has completed his Master's in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University, USA. He was a senior software engineer at Bosch. He has developed many projects such as customer lifetime value prediction model using deep neural networks, deep learning model to predict the quality of life in a particular region, implemented novel computer vision and image processing techniques for fusion of 3D data with 2D data to detect objects and many more. On behalf of IEEE CIS Student Brand Chapter GHRC, I thank him for providing his gracious presence to join us today. Over to you, sir. Uh, great. Uh, that's a pretty well welcome and uh, thanks thanks for that. And yeah, so it's it's all, it's really great to talk to students every time because uh, I'm I'm a student once and uh, it's great that we don't have these kind of privileges, you know, when I was a student. So I really appreciate, you know, as a student organization of, uh, you know, I triply for doing this, you know, for the, especially for the case of students, I I really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, just a second, I'll see if I can. Uh, share something okay yes so can you all see the screen yes so your screen is visible okay great mm, okay Great. So yeah, today uh, we'll be talking about artificial neural networks. So as uh, all, as the introduction was already went, that I'm working as a senior data scientist for Graminar, and we'll be looking into like what are artificial neural networks. So for any application that you are seeing now, you know. Uh, whether you take it in any domain for that matter, it all is developed on the presence of artificial neural networks. So basically the concept of artificial neural networks is to mimic our brain. So our brain is a very powerful organ in our body which can do wonders. So when the scientists thought if we can actually mimic our brain 
and build a physical entity out of it then they thought it can do wonders and it is doing now so for whatever the uh, you know the topic that you take deep learning or convolution neural networks or recurrent neural networks or anything for that matter it all started from the very basic concept of artificial neural networks so from that point you no know, all the things were developed later on so we'll see like why they are so powerful where we do where do we use them why we need to learn all this you know in the in the next uh, uh, coming up talk so the outline would be like why we should learn about artificial neural networks so we'll see like what is the need to learn this topic and what are biological neural networks so i'll give an analogy of what are biologically how our neural networks are placed in our brain to like why the artificial neural networks are so powerful so we we, we try to create an analogy out of it and what are nns like we'll see where where are nns plays now and what what do they do some technical aspects of activation functions and and what are neural networks based on like how do we learn them uh, the back propagation topic and optimization techniques that we use in the you know in order to learn the neural networks and we have few problems within nns or fitting issues we have we'll try to see like what they are and we'll also look into some of the applications yeah that's the thing yeah so uh why should we learn about, about uh, artificial neural networks so like why what is the need to have this talk now so it, the part is like the concept of ai has grown immensely for the past like you know 10 years especially in india if you take uh, you know the advent of jobs you know the people the students who are coming out of colleges you know it's it's kind of a must skill uh, you know people wanted to have it so this is like you know where there is no class subject also when i studied now this was like you know a complete discipline now there are people getting bachelor's degrees in artificial intelligence so like people felt it's hard to teach for a semester artificial intelligence and now they are teaching it for four years so so that's where we can understand you know how much of uh, the revolution happened in artificial intelligence and all this uh, data Uh, driven approaches yeah due to this rise you know because of industries boosting up on the artificial intelligence so much where students who are coming out of the colleges doesn't really have that level of expertise to pick up their jobs so there is always a gap that is created and that's where the events like these are going to help a lot and yeah so and real world application so whatever we do with our data uh, you know simple projects or you know classroom projects they are totally different from the real world data that we do at industry so it's it's totally different uh, totally new it's very hard to depict you you come across data that it's very hard for you to understand so real world applications are really a challenging task for you to address and yeah so that's where you need to learn more and more deeper into artificial intelligence and yeah creating an ability for the machine to learn to think like brain is possibly called as artificial intelligence and so that's where we are right now and so nns the artificial neural networks constitute most of the recent advancements i mean like most of the recent architectures that comes in you know any any for that matter any invention that is being done in the ai world 80% of them comes from the neural networks part so yeah it's good to know them yeah so uh, this is a big branch artificial intelligence is a huge circle where do artificial neural networks fall is what we are looking in now now so this is where they fall so artificial intelligence is a big branch you know in that machine learning is one part of artificial intelligence that takes care of you know ability to learn in machines to think like a human and whereas deep learning is basically not thinking like a human but mimicking a human where you make sure that a machine just mimics the human brain that is particularly is called as deep learning so where we design neural networks that exactly suits how our our brain works so yeah what are biological neural networks so uh so if you i mean i don't know like maybe if you have done your 7th and 8th grades in your school you might have heard about something called as a neuron a dendrite and there is a nucleus this is how our structure is and things like that maybe there is if there is a biology subject in your class and you got a chance Uh, you will just recollect what it does so basically you have a set of input signals that goes towards the dendrites and then dendrites process the information 
and this part of cell is basically called as you know this this whole thing is called a neuron and this part of cell that does the processing is a cell body and the nucleus is the core part that does the processing so you take some input signals dendrites captures those signals like for example if you if you touch something like which is hot so your brain says it's hot and you just remove your hand that's basically a sense of touch right so that signal uh, of saying that it is hot you just have to remove your hand is basically carried out by your brain so that signal is what we say as input signal and dendrites capture that nucleus processes it and you get output signals again through axon terminals so this is how it looks so in the same way if we can have uh, a cell body and some a set of input signals and a set of output signals you can in fact mimic how our brain works so that is the whole concept so you see a lot of diagrams something like this right so it all was taken from this diagram yeah so i'd be happy if you can write things in the chat box or you can speak up whatever but i just want you to undergo a case study along with me so can you tell what's this fruit yeah i mean you can write in chat window you can unmute yourself you can talk or maybe you can just say to yourself like yeah what's this fruit okay so you know what's this fruit great now uh, can you tell me the breed of this dog yeah i think some of the people who are good at dog who love pets you know they can definitely say what this dog is so what breed this is right yeah great now can you can someone tell me what is the name of this bird i guess i guess i guess nobody in the room or in the call know you know what this bird is right so the analogy is your brain from the day it has born or at least from the from the age of 5 or 6 it has been seeing apple every day almost maybe not every day maybe every five times a day or like i mean every five days in a week or something like that no it knows definitely knows that this is apple because it keeps seeing the apple and uh, your brain definitely can recognize what this is because your brain knows that this is apple but when it comes to a dog you know a golden retriever this is golden retriever and i don't know like maybe if you have love for dogs and if you really are good at in looking after them then you can definitely say this is golden retriever but a people who doesn't have love towards pets or they don't have interest in dogs they cannot definitely say this is golden retriever that's because your brain has never gone through that phase of you know knowing whether this is golden retriever or not when it comes to this you no know, nobody knows because this is a, this is basically a very rare species of the bird this is some himalayan greek tail and this is only found in very rare parts of the country nobody heard about it your brain just came to know that this is a bird that existed just just now so your brain has no idea of learning you know how this bird is what this bird is if i give a different picture of this bird your brain still will and you know cannot identify and clearly say yes this is himalayan bird that is because your brain lacks data of himalayan greek tail whereas your brain has so much of data of apple so that's how the neural networks also come into the picture you train neural networks with a specific data you say that this is a car this is a car this is a car to the neural network and it eventually says yes this is a car so if you give if you completely said this is a car this is a car and you start giving bus to the network it can never tell you so that's where if you want to identify the tra- traffic you know you want to identify the objects that are going in the traffic you need to give all different kind of vehicles that are in the scene like you need to give a car you need to give a truck you need to give a bus you need to give a motor vehicle everything so uh, so what i'm trying to say is your brain just your brain the way your brain works neural networks also work since your brain has 26 years of data you know coming alongside our 20 30 years of data or 40 years of data it is able to uh, you know recognize the stuff the way it could but when it comes to on a general analogy it's not going to happen uh, so uh, that's where your neural networks had to be fed with a lot of data for them to classify train really well so i mean that's where you know we have to create an analogy between biology called neural networks to artificial neural networks yeah 
so yeah we'll, we'll see like so uh, where these artificial neural networks are coming into picture so you have lots of data you might have text data image data some survey data or audio data whatever it is so you have a set of data then you need to run some algorithms on top of it to get the insights or the patterns or the you know information out of the data for example i give a uh, you know a set of data of you know a few employees in the in the company and i just want to tell you whether those employees are eligible for a hike based on their data so that is what like you have to provide insights from the data so if you have to get insights from the data you need to apply artificial neural networks in there so apply ans on top of the data and get insights out of it it could be text data then you call it as recurrent neural networks or you know you you can call it as transformers you know recently they have come up and if it is images you call it convolution neural networks which are very powerful if it is some audio data there are speech based networks that does processing you know in fact multi layer perceptrons can be used for speech processing so yeah things like that based on the input data you use a, a, a variant of the artificial neural network to does to do the job for you so if you see this where are artificial neural networks falling into the picture where do we use them so this is a very specific tree every machine learning guy should understand so machine learning there is supervised learning unsupervised learning you have supervised uh, learning means where you have the data to train whereas unsupervised you don't have a previous data to train and these are different algorithms that does work for you classification regression clustering if you observe there is only one thing neural networks that are coming in classification regression and also clustering so a single algorithm or a single approach with a tweak in its architecture and a tweak in its approach can solve the classification problems the clustering problems and regression problems and that's where they are very powerful yeah we will get back to the same picture again we're trying to form an analogy here so if you remember this this the whole picture that we have seen before and we are trying to just form you know a more authentic mathematical approach here to understand how you know the biological networks are formed so for example that's the way that we have input signals i'll give you x1 x2 and x3 which are the inputs and i have weights w1 w2 w3 which gives your output y so these are the weights that defines you know how your network learns how do we train these weights how do we learn the network and all we'll see in the in the in the coming slides yeah so now here you see an input layer a processing neuron layer and then a y so this is basically input and an output if you go a little bit deeper you have something called as hidden layer so you are giving more neurons to the network so this is basically called as a multi layer perceptron this is a single perceptron model which was developed in 1969 this is basically a multi layer perceptron you call it multi layer because you have one more layer in the middle which is hidden layer your input is exposed to the input data your output will be giving you the output data but whatever is lying in between they are all hidden layers if you have 10 hidden layers then you, you call it a very deep neural network if you have few like one or two you you just call it a you know not a, not that deep you can can call it as a shallow neural network but basically that's how it is so whatever the layers in the middle you call them as hidden layers so how do this form so we we'll just take an example so let's say this a is in handwritten text okay some kind of a drawing or some kind of a, a thing that i have written with my own hand so in this in this case so a you, 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 you every image can be divided into a set of pixels and each pixel will be your input to the network so you have 16 by 16 which means you have a grid of 256 pixels and each pixel will be given to the input so x1 will be this pixel x2 will be this x3 will be this like that like, but you have 256 set of pixels as input and you have a hidden layer in the middle and you have 26 weights which are like a b c d and whatever you just have to pick you know which among these weights is correct like whether a is is whatever is written is a or b or c you just have to you know highlight one among these 26 output neurons so that's the thing and that's uh, how we apply this in artificial neural network to a real world image let me see okay maybe there is some issue with that okay fine so um 
Yeah. So why why are we calling them as deep neural networks? Because it has more layers, uh, you know, as we go on. So as I told you earlier, there is only one layer that we are seeing. But if we have more layers within the network, we call it as a deep neural network. Yeah. So that's it with the very basic introduction to the neural networks. But if you see a little bit more into uh, the part of neural networks that is doing an activation, those are called activation functions. So they play a very crucial role in this whole neural network setup, and we see what they do. So basically, activation functions will bring the data to a fixed range. So you have a data that is coming in, a streaming of the data. So you need to make sure that data fits in certain range for you to analyze or bring insights. So if the data is between a preferred range of 0 to 1 or you know between minus 1 to 1, then basically you can understand, OK, so you have a range of data where you can really visualize the stuff. So specifically, why we are doing, why we have to get the data from 0 to 1? Yeah, we'll see that um, at the very end of the network of after each layer you might have an activation function you know coming at after each neuron you basically use it at the output neuron you know for us to define uh you know whether it is a dog or not for us to have a probability to have to get from zero to one we'll use activation function okay there is some problem let me see Should not be the case. Okay. Okay. Great. So uh, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say we have a binary classification of a cat and a dog. So basically, you are giving an input image. Let's say cat or a dog. Your network has to say whether it is cat or dog. So now this particular. Um, this particular output layer has two neurons, and one has to go high whether we, when we give dog image, and the other has to go high when we give cat image. High in the sense it has to be either 0.95 or something like that. The value should be between 0 to 1. So if you see what I'm talking about, like the range should be 0 to 1, this is what I'm talking about. So you should have a probability there where you say, OK, if it is close to 1, then yeah, I mean, that's definitely a dog. If it's not, yeah, we don't consider it as a cat, so we leave this here. So now let's say if I have, well, you know, a cat image coming up, and then you know you see the cat has, you know, a bit higher probability than the dog, whereas earlier you have 0.95, you know, for dog, whereas 0.05 for cat-based output neuron. So for us to get these probabilities, you need to use an activation function in this case, which is called sigmoid. So how does it look? It looks something like this. So you have some data extending from minus infinity to infinity on the x-axis, and you need to bring that data to 0 to 1. So if you see on the y, you have 0 to be the least and 1 to be the highest. So what you have on the x? So I mean, it is drawn from minus 10 to 10 here. But in general, sigmoid takes any value between minus infinity to infinity you know, to give you the values between 0 to 1. So it works by this equation. So if you input something here, you know, in place of z, uh, if you input anything like maybe minus 40, minus 50, whatever, if you input, it gives a data that is between 0 to 1. So this is a sigmoid function that we use at the output layer, a very famous function, a much needed activation function uh, that goes into the deep neural nets for doing the tasks. So activation function decides whether a neuron should be activated or not. So basically, you can use activation functions in the middle layers as well. You can use them in the hidden layers as well. But you need to you need to have an understanding of like when we use an activation function, what does it do to the network? Basically, it is introducing non-linearity into the model. So if you have a simple network with no activation functions, then your output will be just a linear function of your input. Because neural networks are based on the equation y equal to mx plus c. So even if you if you consider this equation, you know your sum will be simply w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3. That will be your sum, which is just a linear sum. So you are not supposed to have a linear sum. Your output cannot be a function of a linear input and a, fun a linear function of the input. You know if you if that is the case, then your neural networks cannot fit all the data. So that's where you need to introduce forcibly the non-linearity into the system 
where you need to have activation functions like sigmoid in the output layer and there are more activation functions we use within the input layer or the hidden layer in especially in the hidden layers we use activation functions to introduce to force non linearity into the system so if you see the purpose of activation function is to introduce non linearity you need to have of non linear non linear models linear models are not going to work because I mean, if you take any any real world problem they are they are no more linear so they are all non linear and you have to introduce non linearity into the system yeah so let's take a simple example so my input is like 1.5 i have a weight of like 0.25 and minus 1.5 what will be the output here so as i said it just a weighted sum so 1 into 0.25 plus 0.5 into minus 1.5 okay that will be 0.25 plus minus 0.05 like which will be like minus 0.5 at this at this output at this hidden neuron okay at the output of the hidden neuron and now you do a squashing squashing when i meant the sigmoid formula if you remember like 1 by 1 plus uh, e power minus z e. this is the formula yeah i apply the same formula here 1 by 1 plus e 0.5, which give you 0.3775. So you're saying you're squashing the output to this value, and since you have taken values like 1.5, you have minus 0.5. If you have inputs like 50 and 60 here, and your value will be somewhere around like 50 or 40. So even if you have that value here, when you squash it, it will come between you no know, 0 to 1. so let's take a simple example sim simple video so the input and then the weight you get some value and then the whatever the value that you have we are doing a sum and we are getting something like minus 0.0548 at the output and then you do a sigmoid on minus not minus 0.48 one by one plus e power minus 448 to get 0.38 so that will be our output 38% so let's take a look again so you have some input value some weight and then you sum it to you know whatever the value within this output neuron you get some sigmoid output and then on top of it you get 38% as the output so you're saying that the input is only 38% survived yeah so what are more activation functions that we have there is tan h that goes from minus 1 to 1 and there is rectified linear unit which does not have the negative part of it only the positively it is linear that's why it's called rectified linear and just there is one linear function as well so these activation functions are used in hidden layers where a sigmoid is specifically used in output layer so when we run a model you can actually input you can have an you know, array loop as part of the middle layers or the hidden layers and you can run your models yeah so now let's come to the part of you know how do yeah how do neural networks work i mean like how do they learn how do they develop the weights how do they how do they you know like modify the weights to a case where it needs to fit the input let's see that so we need to adjust the weights after every iteration to update the network definitely so you cannot have some random weights in the scene which has to say that you know it's a, it's a cat or it's a dog so you need to have some uh, phenomena to update the weights so that it it does the classification in a very well well mannered so in that case we need to adjust the weights after every iteration we'll see how we do that and weight settings determine the behavior of a network and once we have right weights we can use this network for our applications definitely so we need to have right set of weights for us to go ahead so but how how we will find the right weights yeah so yes there comes the concept of the back propagation it's like in gel as a heroic entry in the movies you know that kind of a guys back propagation so this is a very very powerful technique that we use across any uh, neural networks for that matter convolution neural networks you know rnns or anything but the idea of back propagation is a big big through breakthrough you know that happened in the artificial neural networks world that created and that kind of forced a lot of invention later on so we'll see what is back propagation 
So back propagation is simply you're propagating back something. What are you propagating back? Is simply you're propagating back something. What are you propagating back? So you're propagating back the error that is obtained from the output to make sure the weights are adjusted. Simple. So uh, you you say okay cat, but there is a dog there, and but your network predicted cat with a probability of point maybe point seven, but you already know that's the tag. Well, you're training the network, so you, so. Be- Basically, we are talking about here uh, training the network based on back propagation, where you have supervised learning. That is called you have data. So ba- basically, you have you request training set. You have certain inputs saying that okay, this image corresponds dog. You have like maybe hundred images of different dogs, hundred images of different cats you have with you, and then you feed an image of dog to the network, and it said cat. You know it's it's not cat, it's dog. So you, you you say in the network, okay, you predicted it as cat, but actually it's a dog. So you propagate the error that is calculated after that particular case, and you update the weight saying that, hey, man, you, you kind of got that wrong, so you better update your weights. You have took weight of 0.5 earlier, now you might take you know, 0.7 now. Kind of, that kind of uh, information, we send it back. The error we send back to update the weights. That's called back propagation. A very simple technique, but very powerful. So, yeah. Requires training set. You need to have the training data to do back propagation. Starts with small random weights. So you have some random weights to start with. You start with them. And error is used to adjust those weights. So uh, uh, this is supervised learning. We are talking about the supervised learning use case here. Let, let's park the unsupervised learning part a little bit here. We do some assumptions when we are talking about unsupervised learning. Basically, we do a semi-supervised kind of techniques when we do unsupervised. So let's park that aside for now, but let's think of semi-supervised only here. So when you talk about semi-supervised learning, you have the data with you. So error is basically used to adjust those weights. And gradient descent is a very powerful algorithm that we use to minimize this error. So let's see what we are talking about here. So this is a graph that we say like the gradient is going down. So what do you mean by that and all we'll see. So uh, as I said, like back propagation need a training set that is you know, should be a representative of the problem. So if you are talking about cat dog classification, you need to have cat and dog images. If you are talking about apple and orange classification, you need to have those images. If you are talking about a sentiment analysis, you know, for a text, basically you find a lot of reviews on Amazon, okay, saying that, okay, this laptop is good, you know, this particular self cloth is good, washing machine is good. And some people write, this is very bad. So if you have to, you know, uh, categorize those reviews into positive and negative sentiments, possibly you need to have a lot of training data saying that, okay, you have something like this, then it is positive. You have something like this, then it's negative. So you need to have a, a data that is representative for the problem. And during each training epoch, what you do is you kind of submit, uh, you know, you kind of submit training set element as input. So you kind of set a batch as input. You calculate the error of the output neuron. You calculate the average error, and then you adjust the weight. So basically, you calculate the error. You send the error back. While you're sending the error back, you adjust the weights of every hidden layer. Yeah. So for example, let's take this picture. And initially, this picture, you know, when I fed it on neural network, it predicted as Wallace. Okay, I don't say no, it's not Wallace. So I am telling that okay, uh, the machine has training data, so it sees okay, it's not Wallace, it's actually Darwin, and it calculates, you know, with what error, you know, with what probability Wallace was, uh, you know, calculated. It 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 adjusts the probability, it sends the error back, and then it adjusts the weights. Even after adjusting the weights, it is still saying Wallace. Okay, I do the next iteration, I'm, which is what I'm talking about earlier. At every iteration, you need to update the epochs. So in the next iteration, you again calculate the error, you send that error back, you adjust the weights, and then now it might say, yeah, okay, so the one you sent is actually not Wallace, but it is Darwin. So you got it. Now, yeah, we're good. So this is how neural networks learn. So from a more... Uh, a mathematical perspective, let's see. So how do we calculate error? Error is mean square of differences in output layer. So basically, y cap is actually the value that we got, you know, like, let's say the probability with which Darwin, uh, you know, values was predicted, versus, you know, y, the actual value of, you know, saying that it is 
Darwin. So you have a predicted output, you have an actual output. What you do is you kind of take the predicted minus, uh, you know, the actual a mean squared error on top of it. So basically, so when it comes to a logistic regression, you have a logarithmic term here, but don't get carried away with that. But whole point is you need to have a cost function, a, a mean square error here, you know, which does work for you. So basically you're saying that the difference of the error, you know, the difference of the predicted and the actual output, when we term it in the form of an error, that becomes your cost function. Now all we need to do is we need to minimize this error, right? Error should be minimum. Error to say that, you know, it is Darwin or it is Wallace, the error that is occurring in our output or, or, or you know, in the network has to be minimum. How to be, how to be minimize? How do we minimize a function? So if we recollect our mathematics that we studied during our 12th or, you know, during even your, uh, your B-Tech, so basically the derivatives are the things that gives us minimum values. So derivatives, potentially we call it a derivative, but in more mathematical terms, we call it a gradient. So gradient is basically you are doing uh, a a gradient out of it that is like dou w by dou j which gives you uh you know a learning parameter of l followed by, by dou w by dou j so you're finding a basically a gradient of the given equation this is the given equation and you're trying to find the gradient out of it and then l will be a parameter which is called as learning rate we will see the significance of it slowly but basically you need to understand that part like how do we minimize the error? So, yes. So we have a function called f of x, which is of the form this, you know, one by two m into sigma y cap minus y whole square. This is basically a square term, like say f of x equal to m y square kind of term. And then what we need to do is we need to minimize this function. So how do we minimize it? We minimize it by doing the gradient of it. So when we first find the gradient, we get some value. Now what we do? So this is how your cost function looks. This is how your J of W looks. Basically, it's a square term. So we are assuming it will be like a parabola. So if you remember, you know, Y equal to MX square is basically a parabola. So in the same way, now you have an equation J equal to some Y cap minus Y whole square, which is which looks like a parabola. Uh, may not be exactly like a parabola, but yeah, let's assume for us to understand gradient descent, we'll start with that. So when you initially have some weight and you calculate the gradient it, it would probably be somewhere around here okay so what is called descent so basically when you update your weights the gradient has to go down it has to descend so if you recollect the figure here that we are talking about the kind of error started here where there is a black dot and kind of slowly it came down okay if you see if in a 3d mesh view it looks like this when it looks from a 3d a 2d view Basically, you have a parabola. The, the gradient starts somewhere in here. As you, you know, update your weights slowly, the gradient has to come down and it has to reach its minimum. Right. So when it reaches its minimum, basically the gradient is descending, which when it reaches its minimum, basically you're saying that your cost function has a minimum of the error. So your error is minimized. So that's the thing. So basically you have a gradient descent. It starts at very beginning. And when the weight gets improved, you know, you update the weights after every iteration, the gradient descent takes little amount of steps and it eventually reaches minimum. Okay, this is a schematic, you know, for the gradient descent where it has the minimum value. So how we are updating the weights again, I'll repeat. So basically there is a technique called back propagation where we have some error, we send that error towards the front, you know, we are sending the error back, propagating the error from the output layer to the input layer. In the meantime, where there are hidden layers, there are hidden weights, we update those weights accordingly with respect to this error. Once we have those weights, we feed those weights to the gradient descent to minimize the error and we get something like this. Yeah, so now when we talk about uh, learning rate parameter, what we have here, which is defining our gradient, there are some issues in choosing this learning rate. So if you have done a tiny, teeny programming, uh, you know, in, in regarding developing a neural network, you have, you have come across something called as a learning rate, or in some cases they call it alpha, no, whatever. This parameter is going to 
uh, be very effective in order to choose you know best set of weights for our network so why because learning rate is the one which chooses how much of the gradient is being shifted so if you choose very small learning rate you know the gradient takes tiny teeny steps to go down it will train for in definite amount of time and there is in mind the sense you have some curve like this the actual uh, minimum is here but it might stuck here when you choose a very very low learning rate when you choose a very high learning rate the issue is it kind of gets shooted up you know it starts from here it goes here it goes here it goes here so there is no particular way of it going down eventually it just you no know, it shoots up so when you choose high learning rate so how do you choose best learning rate yeah nobody knows basically you need to pick a value which is suitable i mean you should not have learning rate like 1 2 3 4 something like that or you should not have learning rate like point not 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 5 or something like that so you need to choose a value which you know which goes well you know if you do like couple of projects you'll come to know okay maybe this learning rate going to do well kind of yeah problems with anns so when we spoke about you know an artificial neural network has certain issues the very primary issue of anns is overfitting so basically what what happening here is so we trying to learn the network so much that it only understands the value from the training data so for example if i give 100 red apples to the network and start training it completely it cannot identify the green apple so it just thinks that apple has to be in red in color or it might think what whatever is red in color it is apple so the network might think either of the ways when you keep training network with same set of data that is called overfitting so uh, it's only take so if you give 100 data sets 100 data samples of the data which are all similar then it will only consider that image as apple and if you have slight variation of the figure of apple you know maybe giving it a green apple or you know half cut apple something like that it cannot recognize so that is called overfitting so how does this come uh, you know the basically you are just giving similar data to the network that's one reason and you are training network for indefinite amount of time so you need to stop the training at some point so if you if you see the performance of the model so the training set performance will eventually increase as time goes okay so it will definitely recognize all those 100 apples there is no doubt in that but when it comes to test set the performance at some stage would be really high but as you keep training you know as the training time increases the test set performance will eventually decrease and it the the model completely gets overfitted and it will not take any data uh, that is coming out of the training set it cannot recognize any data that is coming out of the training set so you give 100 golden retriever dogs to train the data and if you give husky it will not predict that it has dog it, it cannot predict so basically 100 golden retrievers of same size same breed and all it cannot recognize so when you have to do dog cat classification you need to give different breeds of dogs to the uh, the data should be you know at least a little to variant not highly variant again you know where where you give 100 golden retrievers 100 huskies that is not going to work again it should not be like too variant and it should not be like you know too uh, biased where you only have one set of data you need to pick good set of data you know where it is distributed across multiple ways and you need to definitely care take care of you know your training time so you need to stop training at some point you need to have a check validation check which says that okay we will better stop training you know uh, at this point so for this what people have done is let's say if you have 100 samples of your data we don't give 100 samples to the training i give only 80 samples to the training i park those 20 samples i call it as cross validation or validation so basically i take those 20 values at every iteration i check whether the model is doing well on those 20 images or 20 data points which are not part of the training data so do you get it so if i have 100 images i only take 80 images for training i put i consider those 20 images as test data i'll say that the network has never seen those 20 images and every time when i run the epoch i feed those 
fifty images to the data and say whether how good the model is running. So we do a validation check there. We see okay if the validation loss is you know eventually decreasing, and it's a clear indication that your model is fitting less on the test data or a data that it has never seen. So where you stop? Yeah. So we'll see more clear from classification in a more regular way. Let's say I have a set of red dots. I have a set of green dots. Assume we want to separate the red from the green dots. The network will learn to do well in the training case, but we have learned only one particular sort of training set. We did the learning, and you see there are two different curves. One curve is this, you know, which is having too many, you know, like bends and all. Whereas one curve, it's a little too steep, which is taking, uh, you know, only one path. So if you see this bending curve, yeah, this part, this is basically overfitting. so it is trying to cover each and every point of the red okay in this case what happens let's see i have a new test data that came up and we have some part of you know reds on this side of the curve and we have some part of uh, sorry we have some sort of greens on this side of the curve and we have some part of reds coming on the other side of the curve what happens the curve that you have taken initially you know which is passing through every data point it eventually fails you need to have a generalized you know network model or a fit that can actually take cover all the data points so for example if you see this curve these are set of data points and you are just drawing a line this we call it as underfitting we are not training the data completely this is an ideal fit so it is like doing well even the one or two points are missing that's fine well in this case it's trying to cover each and every point that is in the model and this is basically overfitting so you are fitting everything in the training data and when new data comes your model fails and that is called overfitting so what do we do uh, there is something called as early stopping so you need to be vigilant about you know how the network is training and you need to stop it you know at some point okay you better stop the stop training the model based on some validation checks of your you know preemption you need to come up with you know how do we stop the network weight initialization so there are hell lot of techniques that came up now to initialize the weights at a place it's not just random you need to initialize them in a way that you know it does well where it doesn't get overfitted so those techniques are developed now you can use them a very powerful technique is regularization so basically what regularization mean is you actually take the weight parameters and you make sure that they don't shoot up by using a parameter called lambda so you take the square terms of all the weights which are your parameters the ones that are causing the line to to take n number of curves so basically this is the, the the line curve you know the curve that we are talking about will take the equation like something like w1 you know x square x1 square w2 x2 square like that so you have a weight that is coming up here and those weights you know w1 w2 are the reason for the curve to go too many bends all you need to do is to decrease those values okay you need to, you should not have like 1000 you know or you know uh, like 1000 w 1000 x square you know like 5000 x cube if you have something like that then your curve is going to take uh, you know a lot of bends then you need to have come up with a regularization parameter which decreases your weights and that is what we are doing here that is called regularization which will regularize your weights and then uh, one more powerful technique which is especially suited for artificial neural networks and cannot be applied anywhere else is basically dropouts so dropout in the sense you need to drop a certain set of neurons uh, while you are training a model so let's say hidden layer has 10 neurons so in one iteration you remove two neurons in the day 10 neurons you only train eight neurons in a network and in the next iteration you do a mix and match of you'll take you'll you'll consider the two neuron that you left earlier and you'll remove two more neurons now you have again eight neurons and you you are leaving two neurons and in the next iteration you you remove two more neurons you add up whatever you have removed in the earlier and you continue the training process this is basically called as dropout so this has proved that you know machine learning or artificial neural networks cannot get overfitted if you use dropouts dropouts are very very powerful technique and why do they work because neurons are the ones that are getting trained you know that are having weights so if you have some neurons dropped out so they don't train at every iteration at every epoch where they are not seeing all the data 
which is good so that's where you know dark ports are going to play a crucial role yeah so the t part technical part everything done now we go to some applications so uh, types of ann so as i told like anns are there are very 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 different kinds of anns that are used in different applications for example if you have recurrent neural networks they are completely used in text data text based processing text recognition sentiment analysis text classification all that stuff and when there is sequence to sequence models so if you take google you know there is google translate that you are aware of if you write something in one language it will translate to a different language how this is happening for example if you are aware of uh, i know like most of us are aware of hindi if you say a word in english a sentence in english the, the translation in hindi is not completely the same layer you have first word to be the first word second word to be second word it's not going to happen okay so the words get jumbled uh, when it comes to hindi's translation of english so how we are doing this still in that case so that is only possible with sequence to sequence models which are also a part of you know anns and there is convolution neural networks if you take any base any image based recognition technique may it be yolo object detection object detection techniques like yolo faster rc and nor if you take semantic segmentation models like unet or whatever if you take any network it is based on convolution neural networks which is very 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 powerful for computer vision based applications and they are one of the best inventions you know which were made as well as rnns which are powerful for text based recognition because they are running time yeah and there is a uh, more radial based networks which are especially used for face recognition they are very powerful and there is multi layer perceptron as we have seen earlier which is used for digit recognition hand written recognition structured data analysis like we have a lot of data of employees coming in you know where the, we have age salary of the employee you know number of years of experience we have this kind of data and they might ask you like you have to pick whether that that employee will get a hike or not or whether that employee will leave the organization soon so people will ask you to do this kind of analysis and you need to use multi layer perceptrons there they are very 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 powerful so these are like some of the anns types of anns which are used in many applications so let's see uh, a very famous application of handwritten recognition so basically you write 0 1 2 3 in whatever the writing that you have it has to come up with 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so that's basically handwritten digit recognition so there is a very famous famous data set called mnist you know you can use anywhere you can type anywhere and you can see it basically that is having a lot of handwritten recognized uh, digits available and you have to use the data to train your model so basically these are all zeros people write zero in a different way people write one in a multiple way so they just have to they just got multiple ways of writing each of those digits and then they did the training to the network and they were able to recognize zero to nine in a very very well in fact so a famous guy from university uh, i don't remember raisen i guess raisen university has created a picture of how things work when we are uh, had doing the handwritten recognition using neural networks so for example if you have four you know in the next layer in the second layer you see things like this that is like hidden layer 1 let's say in hidden layer in hidden layer 4 you have like this in layer 5 hidden layer 6 so in each layer you know the 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 way that it is understanding the four that it is taking the crucial components out of it it goes like this this is basically a convolution neural network where the size of the image that is inputted will eventually turn as a flat line okay so that is what happens in convolution neural networks so but for you to understand in the convolution so the, the the concept of the four is eventually changing and it is kind of preserving the features as we move towards the end yeah let's see if we can really watch this video um uh, not sure okay let's see okay okay so we are trying to visualize neural networks
so this is a neural network basically so this is the perceptron that we are talking about so it has a set of so he mentioned there are like three hidden layers one two and three output layer so yeah it's kind of trying to predict what are the given digits yeah so the most powerful cnns so we are actually visualizing them in the form of you know image image based classification so where you have the layers something like this and they eventually go up to you know like 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 8 9 so yeah these are the middle layers that you have uh yes so these are like the hidden layers that you we are talking about so a big image is eventually converted into a smaller data samples whereas here you know if we talk about here uh you know this is hidden layer 1 hidden layer 2 and hidden layer 3 we have you know which are pointing to you know the input and then we are eventually like if you have two here yeah the two gets you know highlighted here so that's basically how uh we are visualizing the neural networks yeah so yeah so that's it i mean actually i'm done with the presentation so if you have any questions you can go ahead thank you so much sir for delivering an amazing session uh now the question the session is open for questions so audience can ask questions when muting themselves or drop it into the chat box sure um okay uh, if you have anything if you have anything in the chat box you can ask me like i did not i mean i i haven't noted any of the questions so you can write in the chat window if you have any questions or you can open up and speak to me anything regarding the presentation or anything in general yeah you can we can talk I guess the audience don't have questions so can they contact you later Sure no issues yeah I can give you my ID Yes I'll write my email here um Okay So where you can reach out to me on my email or I'll give my profile LinkedIn profile you can contact me there as well Okay, great. So, if you have anything, please ping me freely on LinkedIn, or you can talk to me or email. I'm free to answer any of your questions regarding anything, career paths, or this or anything, anything for that matter. I'll try to answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. so yeah thanks for giving the opportunity i'm pretty happy to was able to deliver a talk to some of the very good students you know i feel very nice this is very great initiative from you guys yeah
Now that we have come to the end of today's program, I would like to invite Ms. Aditi Bodade, Executive Committee Member at IEEE's Student Branch Chapter, to deliver a vote of thanks. Am I audible? Yes, Aditi, you are audible. Good evening, all. I am Aditi Bodare, volunteer at IEEE CIS Student Branch Chapter, GH Raisani College of Engineering. Now, it seems to be a great pleasure to propose the vote of thanks to, on behalf of entire team to all who have helped us in making this event a very uh, resounding success. First of all, I would like to give my hearty vote of thanks to our guest of honor, Mr. Nanda Kishore M, for sparing his time and gracing today's event. I would like to thank our director of GH Raisani College of Engineering, Dr. Sachin Antable, for his kind support. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our chapter advisor, Professor Rachama Thomas, for her guidance and constant support. Well, an event like this, I must mention profound sense of appreciation to the team of IEEE CIS GHRC for their hard work and dedication. I request all the attendees to fill the feedback form for this session in order to get the e-certificate. Thank you so much. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm taking leave. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You can scan the code which is shown on the screen. You get the feedback.